really privileged to introduce our speaker today. I really don't need to do the introduction, but anyway, I'll, I'll do it. But uh, the combustion theory, uh, it's a very, really fundamental topic, very important topic, and we try to find uh, the, the, the leading person, and one of them is uh, Professor Heinz Pitch. And uh, the, he's influencing in this uh, area, not only technical, but also if you guys think a little bit more actually his students has now really populated all the major universities uh, in, in, in the US. So, so it's really very privileged that you guys can, can be here and then listen to what, what he has to say. And uh, uh, it's, again, it's one of the foundational courses for the, for the center, combustion theory. And he would tell about the theory, but also the relation to turbulence and the relation to computation. So uh, I don't want to take up much of his, his time, so I leave the class to him, and then he will tell you all the wonders <laughs> about combustion theory. Good. Um. Good, uh, good thing you applaud now, because at the end of the week, you won't have the power anymore uh, to, <laughs> to do this. So, um, good morning everyone, welcome to this class, Combustion Theory. I um, uh, look forward to teaching this course. I taught this course now many, many times. Um, I, I teach combustion course also in our university, but um, uh, I, uh, Professor Law uh, invited me. I can't even remember when the first time was, but, but I have taught it a few times here and then also at the Beijing Summer School and it's always um, always for me also a very good experience. Um, a big difference between, um, uh, I shouldn't say this because we are on video, but, but uh, a big difference between this course and a course I teach at home to the students is that the, let's say the fraction of people who are really interested in this, in, in this course is higher than, uh, than at home. Uh, the <laughs> students have to take it. And uh, not, not everyone uh, gets totally excited about it. Uh, not as excited as, as, as I get about it, and uh, hopefully a few of you also. So uh, in this course, I'll, I'll show you in a minute, uh, we touch on many different subjects. I mean, we have one week now, and we will go uh, fast, but you'll see, especially in the beginning, most of you probably know all that stuff already, um, but it's good to, sometimes good to um, repeat and also uh, start uh, with um, uh, fundamentals to kind of get to a common language. And so um, I want to start giving you a, a short introduction of um, why I think um, combustion is important and also uh, important for our future as a society. And before we do this, we'll uh, change the microphone real quick. Okay, good. So, so um, it's, it's of course obvious that uh, combustion is, um, uh, uh, is omnipresent, is, is present everywhere. It's uh, in combustion engine of cars, it's in, uh, 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 in uh, it, it powers uh, propulsion uh, of aircrafts, it's um, uh, used for uh, power generation. Most of the uh, power, electrical power we use is from combustion of fossil fuels. I'll, I'll show this to you uh, in a minute. Uh, this here is a gas turbine. Um, it's used in um, industry and house, household burners. Uh, this is an industry burner. This is actually a burner that we run in our lab, um, which is um, a part of a little device that you might have in your bathroom on the wall uh, that, uh, that just produces hot water, uh, where we try to uh, reduce um, uh, NOx emissions for future gen generations uh, of, of such burners. And then, of course, um, uh, fire safety is, is a very important topic. Uh, explosions, for example. Uh, you see this here. Might, some of you 
might be uh, reminded of the, um, the fire of the Grandfield Tower, which almost almost exactly one year, which was almost exactly one year ago in England. And, um, but this is not a picture of that. This is a picture from a standard textbook uh, where uh, it is shown already that, that um, actively burning materials can lead to, uh, uh, building materials can lead to uh, really disastrous uh, fires. Uh, after the Glenfeld uh, fire, people seemed astonished and surprised that, uh, that, that it is dangerous um, to uh, use um, uh, burning materials. Another issue that's, that's quite interesting is, um, uh, or important is uh, fire safety for household appliances like this. Um, uh, some of you might remember uh, that a uh, long time ago, uh, refrigerants were uh, fluorochlorohydrocarbons, uh, uh, FCKW is what we say in Germany, I don't know the English term. Um, but, but these uh, were found to be, uh, to destroy the ozone layer, which, which, which uh, protects our planet. And then they were banned. And then afterwards, um, people used uh, fluorohydrocarbons. And um, turns out these are, these, are, uh, these are okay, but they have a very high global warming potential, su uh, super high global warming potential. And now uh, people try to use uh, new, uh, find new refrigerants which are, uh, you know, have a, a good on these two issues, but at the same time also they are safe because um, if you have a, a hydrocarbons, for example, can be used as refrigerants, but hydrocarbons, um, you know, as you know, they, they burn quite well, uh, some of them, and uh, it, it might be very dangerous if you have a leak uh, in, in your kitchen. So together with NIST, this is also a project that we have right now, um, together with NIST we are trying to... Um, understand the um, uh, uh, combustion properties of some of these new refrigerants. So all of these issues are um, very important and they're all around us. Um, but of course, so, so in a sense, we can't really live without combustion and combustion research. At the same time, uh, combustion is bad. It produces uh, emissions, pollutants, but also uh, pollutants such as uh, particulates, um, uh, uh, nitric oxides, and uh, you know other pollutants, and uh, but also green greenhouse gases like CO2, which lead to uh, global warming. Um, the design challenge is then that um, combustion is very very complex. We'll see this in the next uh, few days. Um, it is an interaction of uh, many different physical aspects, like turbulence, uh, chemistry, um, um, uh, viscous flow, and so on and um, uh, sometimes multi-phase flow, and also it lives on many different uh, time and length scales, multi-scale multi uh, problem. Um, very often, devices are big and, and high power, like aircraft engine, gas turbine, or this industrial burner, and it's very hard to do experiments also. But very often, the experiments are being done uh, really have nothing to do with a, with a real gas turbine. We look at the chemistry sometimes, in a, a small laboratory flame, and, and we think that we can use the chemistry, uh, you know, to describe what happens in, in a gas turbine, which is at totally different conditions, high pressure, uh, high temperature, and all of this. And, and that's kind of the best we can do sometimes, uh, but, but it is a, is a challenge. And then the other, the other uh, challenge is, in these severe uh, environments, measurements are very difficult, and in order to really understand what's going on, um, sometimes we have um, uh, fuels that, uh, during their combustion process, produce many different intermediate species, maybe hundreds of intermediate species. But, but the measurements are usually done for one or two species. And then uh, maybe only locally, maybe only in one point, and, and not in, in three dimensions. So uh, from that information for a modeler, it's very hard to understand uh, what's going on. So, um, uh, very often, we try to understand combustion to develop models then uh, to enable computation engineering, which is very important because of all these reasons uh, that I mentioned here. Now, the question is, why is combustion still important? Uh, it is a science that has been around for a long, long time. And, um, you know, one could think maybe we know everything. 
Um, you, you know, of course, that, uh, that that is not the case. I mean, if we knew everything, we wouldn't produce uh, engines that have super high efficiency. We wouldn't produce engines that have uh, emissions uh, and so on. So, um, so the, um, uh, the, the question is why, why do we still care? Uh, if you look at the news, you know, everything is being electrified and, and, and combustion is bad and it, it, it might go away. But the numbers show that it will not go away, that it will be very important in the future, which is why uh, it's so important to try to, uh, first of all, try to make what we do in a better way, but then also maybe look at new avenues in combustion that um, uh, will help us in the transition of, um, in, of our energy um, into a world where we have, uh, re where everything is renewable uh, and with no uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. So uh, these are just a few numbers that I pulled out of different um, projections. This is the um, uh, International Energy Outlook here from 2016. Uh, this says that in 2040, uh, up to, from 2012 to 2040, the energy demand will increase by 50%. So energy demand keeps going up. Um, and even if we install more and more uh, renewables, uh, shown here, the fraction of renewables doesn't really go up because we, um, uh, we, we use more uh, energy in the future. This projection says that in 2040, still more than 75% are, uh, come of, of all the uh, energy we use come from uh, combustion of fossil fuels. Liquid fuels means oil, uh, coal here, and then uh, natural gas. Uh, it's a game of large numbers. When we look at these um, uh, graphs like this, here 10 to the 15 uh, British thermal units, uh, I don't understand these numbers. I, I don't even have a good feel for it. I don't know what 10 to the 15 means, okay? But one can break it down uh, into something uh, that we understand maybe a little better. Uh, hundred, this corresponds to 120 million tons of CO2 emissions daily, okay? 120 million tons, that's also, that's also a very large number that we don't understand. But if you, um, if you normalize this to per capita, then this is 13 kilogram of CO2 emission per person every day. Okay, so imagine you would have to always carry your CO2 that you emit per day until the evening. Then you always have a big backpack with 13 kilo uh, of, of CO2 every day. If you have to carry it a week, maybe you could load it off only on Fridays, then uh, uh, it's 13 times seven, uh, 91, whatever that is, uh, 91 kilo. So, so that, that is really a lot and it shows you, uh, you know, how bad that, uh, that problem is. Um, we use, in the world, we use a 10 billion liter of fuel in transport every day. It's about, it's about um, 4 billion uh, diesel, 4 billion uh, gasoline, and 1 billion uh, for aviation fuels. Uh, maybe it's 9 or 10, okay? So um, that's a lot also. That means every, every single one of us and, and throughout the world uses 1.3 liter of fuel, liquid fuel every day for transport. So it's obvious somebody has to, something has to be done. Uh, and it's obvious. So these are all numbers for 2040. It's not now. And it's 2040. So we talk about electrification in the transport sector. Um, uh, th at least these projections here say it's not going to happen. Um, so clean combustion is extremely important. Uh, this shows the energy demand by region in the throughout the world and by type. And you see here uh, China is a big user of energy. When I said earlier the, the uh, energy uh, consumption will go up, it will go up mostly in non-OECD countries. OECD countries, it, will, it's about, it keeps about the same, uh, stays about the same, and in, uh, bas basically in the India and China, uh, energy demand uh, will go up to levels uh, you know, that, that are reached somewhere else in the world. So this year is 2040, and you see that in China, uh, combustion of coal 
is a big, uh, uh, is, is, is very, very important. Uh, this is not good because coal uh, per unit energy you produce, of course, has much higher CO2 emissions. I'll show you this uh, a, a little later. Um, and then you see here the different oil. So this coal, oil, and gas. So the first three are fossil, and the rest is non-fossil, nuclear, and then hydro, bio, and re other renewables. So the fraction here of renewables is very small. United States, small, India, Europe, uh, Africa. Africa, it's, it's only large because of what? Why does Africa have so much uh, renewable fuel consumption? Because they use wood for cooking, for heating. They just burn the wood they, they find, uh, which is also not good because that leads to a lot of uh, emissions. And typically, the stoves they have, they're not very energy efficient. So this looks like, oh, great, in Africa, everything's good, but it's not. So, so throughout the world, here, Middle East, there's, there's almost no renewable energy, uh, even though there's a lot of sun there. The other thing that's very interesting is to see what kind of energy is being used. You see here, uh, uh, gas in, in the US is a, is a big factor. Uh, in India, also, coal is important in Europe. Uh, gas and oil are important. <laughs> Europe tries to get away from uh, burning coal uh, and so on. The other thing that's, a, that's interesting is, um, is how much energy is used. Uh, that has nothing to do with our class here. It's still interesting. How much energy is used per uh, capita in, in different places in the world? And you see here China uses about three uh, ton oil equivalent um, per person. Uh, is the same, same in uh, Europe, roughly. Uh, in the US, people use more than twice as much okay, per, per person. Um, so one way to reduce CO2 emissions would to just cut this energy consumption by half by just using the same uh, people use uh, in other parts of the world. And of course, also, China, Europe, maybe cut energy demand more uh, and, and to reach levels that are being used here. For example, India and Africa, uh, it's even much less. So if we wanna, I said earlier, uh, you know, people talk a lot about electrification uh, of, for example, uh, passenger cars. And so this is the projection of the uh, energy used in, uh, transport, in the transport sector worldwide in 2040. And you see electric vehicles here, they are very small, a very, very small fraction of this actually is um, here, even in the best possible, the 450 scenario, that's a very optimistic scenario. Uh, even there, it's 6% it's battery electric vehicle. So this year, uh, this year would be vehicles that are, that are only electric, not, not hybrid uh, combustion uh, battery. Probably most cars at that time uh, are uh, hybrid, but, but a small fraction is just electric. And then even if uh, all vehicles would be electrified, then this makes sense only if also the energy, the, the, the electricity that you use to power these vehicles, if, if the electricity also comes from renewable resources. But this is the, this is the electricity generation uh, production uh, in 2040. And you see also here, there's a very small fraction renewables, okay? So, um, so the point is combustion is still important. Uh, this here is a little complex. Uh, this is from the, um, uh, uh, here from the World Energy Outlook. Uh, 2015, there's, meanwhile, there's a new in, uh, a version of this, uh, but it doesn't have this nice figure. I really like this figure. Uh, a little complicated, but it shows you um, everything that happens in the energy sector. Uh, it shows you on the left here the primary uh, energies coal, natural gas, oil, nuclear, and renewables, and you see the fractions. Uh, and again, this is a projection here for 2040. It shows you the, the fractions. And then here on the right, it shows you where the energy is being used. Okay, so you see roughly a third is used in industry, a third is used in transport, a third is used in buildings for, for heating, cooling, uh, and things, uh, you know, electricity that's being used and, and so on. So, so each is roughly one-third, and you see how the energy streams 
go from one to the other. So here's, for example, uh, um, production of electricity, and then um, uh, here, uh, you've, so you have um, uh, losses here, for example, and then um, you see how the uh, fluxes go to the right. And that kind of shows you, um, that kind of shows you how you could, uh, how you could, um, sorry, I said this is electricity, no, this is direct use, this here is electricity, and it shows you also how, when you have a power plant, how you have strong uh, conversion losses uh, from primary energy uh, to usable energy at the end. But, but this also shows you now, if you want to change things, you want to make the world more energy efficient, more uh, renewable, uh, what, what, what can you do? And uh, what's interesting is here, you can look at three different parts. The energy use is important. Uh, you can change something in the primary energies, and also you cha can change something in the conversion process. And conversion process, of course, it, it just means you have to make things uh, more efficient, um, uh, you know, higher, higher efficiency uh, processes, just better. On the end use side, uh, what is the opportunity? Uh, the opportunity is electrification. Instead of using, uh, f you know, f um, uh, liquid fuels, for example, you could um, uh, pro um, provide process heat by electricity. Uh, that's, that's, you know, might be good, but uh, it means also that that electrical power has to be from renewable sources. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make too much sense, okay, because, because of the conversion losses uh, I, I just mentioned. Um, then... The other uh, issue is that um, in many applications, you need heat at very high temperature, and at very high temperature means that um, you cannot get it from electricity. You have to burn something. Sometimes um, the chemical reactions that happen, they are also important for the, for the process. And so not all uh, industrial processes can be, uh, can be electrified. And then there are applications that need very high power density, here, ships, uh, airplanes, uh, trucks, and so on, they are also, one, one basically has to rely on, on liquid fuels. Uh, it's, it's very hard to power these devices otherwise. So that's the, the consumption then on the uh, primary energy side. The best we can possibly do, uh, if we're interested in combustion or not, is to replace combustion by renewable energy um, from wind, from solar, you know, all these nice things. Um, so this green arrow here, it should become actually very wide to cover this entire site. Uh, but you see the projection is that uh, um, in 2040, it's, it's a small fraction. But that, that would be the most important thing. But, but everyone here knows this is not so easy. It's in, as a matter of fact, it's very hard uh, to do that. The other, the other um, uh, opportunity here is to just use cleaner fuels. Uh, why don't we, if we burn stuff, why don't we just burn stuff that burns more cleanly? Um, for example, if one replaces um, uh, coal by natural gas, uh, we have almost 50% lower specific uh, carbon emissions, CO2 emissions, uh, from, from natural gas than from coal. So that natural gas combustion, maybe also in vehicles, maybe in... Um, uh, um, you know, in other processes, um, that, that might be very useful. Also, one can produce natural gas. If we have a lot of uh, renewable electricity, one could produce uh, natural gas from that. Uh, renewable electricity uh, is not so hard to do that. The other one is to use uh, biofuels or bio-e-fuels. What, what people call e-fuels is to use uh, renewable energy to convert maybe CO2 back into, uh, you know, fuels, liquid fuels or, or other hydrocarbon fuels which can be stored well. Um, in Aachen, we have a, a big center on biofuels. It's called tailor-made fuels from biomass. And the idea there is to design fuels, new fuels, that are uh, very cheap in, in, in being produced. They're very energy efficient. You keep the energy uh, from the plant uh, into, the, um, uh, into the liquid fuel, uh, and also the, that conversion into a liquid fuel happens with very little CO2 emissions. And then at the same time, we want to design the fuel in a way 
that it, it's an ideal fuel for an engine, that it, it allows you to build an engine with super high efficiency uh, and ultra low emissions, okay? So uh, the center tries to do a joint optimization for both sides, and it has very close interactions and collaboration between chemists, chemical engineers that make the fuels, and then combustion engineers that look at uh, how, how these fuels would be converted uh, in a combustion engine. So, so, so that, that, is, uh, that is one interesting opportunity. Uh, and then the other one is carbon-free fossil fuel combustion, uh, which means you burn coal, which is bad, but then you just capture the CO2 and you do something with it. Uh, maybe, maybe you just, um, you just uh, using uh, electricity, you convert it back to uh, liquid fuels to be used somewhere else. Uh, maybe you want to dig it up uh, in your neighbor's backyard, which is called then carbon capture and storage. Um, so calm capture storage and calm capture and utilization, meaning you use the CO2 uh, for, something, for something good. Uh, uh, also for this, we have a, a, a center in Aachen that looks at oxy fuel combustion, where you try to um, take the, uh, um, uh, the coal, you burn it with pure, let's say with, not with air, but you burn it with pure oxygen. And if you burn with, with oxygen, then the only combustion products are uh, CO2 and water. You can condense the water, you have pure CO2, okay? So that's a so-called carbon capture technology. But um, in order to keep the temperatures down, you don't use pure uh, uh, oxygen. You dilute um, the um, oxygen with, with the CO2 you just captured. So now you have a totally different combustion atmosphere than what we are used to, and a lot of uh, research is going on to try to understand that CO2, for example, is not as inert as nitrogen, and, and it will interact, it will uh, undergo chemical reactions with the coal. So all of these topics here, they require new uh, research. Uh, the other one is um, uh, renewable, how to use renewable electricity. Let's say you had electricity, you had renewable electricity. Uh, then, uh, for example, in Europe, we, we don't have the space to produce a lot of renewable electricity. Uh, in Germany, basically everywhere you look, if, you, if you, I drop you at some point in Germany and you look around, you see a, a, a windmill uh, you know, that's, that's producing uh, wind electricity. It's, it's full, everything is full. There, there's no more space to put much more, uh, which is a big issue. But the other places, like I said earlier, maybe Middle East, they have a lot of sun, Africa has a lot of sun, and you could have uh, solar panels there, you could have, um, uh, you know, produce a lot of electricity, but then how do you get that electricity to different parts in the world? Um, you cannot put a big cable there, a big cable just doesn't work. So one uh, possibility to transport big uh, amounts of energy is like, like it's done now, you, you convert the electricity into a chemical uh, compound, uh, that stores the, uh, the electricity or the energy uh, chemically, and then you, you burn that uh, compound again uh, to produce electricity in, in a different part of the world. So, for example, you could produce hydrogen. Hydrogen is, is, is difficult, difficult also to transport, but that, that is um, that's one uh, possibility. Uh, E-fuels are another one. Uh, there is a, 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 a component, uh, oxymethylene ether, uh, that, uh, that people are looking at as an e-fuel can be produced uh, from, from carbon sources uh, plus uh, renewable electricity. Uh, ammonia uh, is another one, NH3. Why ammonia? Because the, uh, producing ammonia is, is one of the best known uh, uh, chemical engineering um, uh, uh, processes uh, in the world. You know, it has been, has been studied. It's, uh, it's very well known how to produce it. Um, and if you burn, if you burn ammonia, NH3, the combustion products, if you do everything right, are N2 plus water, okay? N2 plus water, you, I mean, you can condense the water, but you could just release it in the air and everything's fine, okay? So, so this also has, um, then, again, if you do it right, has zero emissions. But of course, you see already what the problem is. Uh, what's the problem? Yeah, so if you try to convert this, uh, then you will get a lot of NO. 
Uh, that's just what it is. Because you need, the, you need the oxygen, you form a lot of NO. So how to burn this um, without producing a lot of NO? That's, again, that's an important research question. Um, so all of, these, all of these topics, then, um, are, uh, require new research. And the point I want to make here is that the energy transition into a world where we have no, uh, where, we, where we rely only on renewable energies is not possible without combustion. Even if everything is renewable, a big fraction of the end use energy that, that, that is being used will still come from combustion of maybe uh, biofuels, um, maybe here with carbon capture technologies and so on. By the way, the national engineer, the national, the US National, national Academy of Engineering has a list of what they call the 14 grand challenges of engineering. Has anyone ever looked at this list? That's what you guys should look at because you, you have to solve these. I mean, if, if not you, who else will solve these? Um, uh, so one, challenge number 10 or whatever, I can't remember. Challenge number 10 is carbon capture and storage. That's one. The, the, it's, it's obvious that, that you cannot have a, a, a future energy market um, without burning coal, or, or let's say it differently. If there's coal, it will be burned at some point. Somebody will come and, and burn that coal. And so um, we need technologies to do, this, to do this well. OK, so that just to make the point that uh, you know, for survival of of uh, people on this planet, it is very important not just to say, let's get rid of all combustion research. It's very important to address all these new questions uh, that will allow us to, um, produ to produce energy cleanly. Uh, it, it will not go without. OK. So then uh, let, me, let me get to uh, the actual topic here of combustion. Uh, what is combustion? Um, there is. Um, in mechanical engineering, uh, where we do chemical reactions, we, we call it combustion, uh, mostly. The chemical engineers, uh, they, they also do a lot of uh, chemical reactions coupled with fluid dynamics and so on. They don't call it combustion. So, so what is the difference between um, chemical reactions in combustion and in, for example, fuel oxidation, instead of burning a fuel, you could also oxidize it in a fuel cell, PEM fuel cell. For example, you put in hydrogen, you get um, water. What's the difference? The stoichiometric ratio uh, is, is actually the same, but, but how to control this, that's, that's very different. But I mean just the, you know, the very principle of, of um, what's the main, the big difference. What makes combustion so complicated? Uh, it, it compared with oxidation in a, in a fuel cell. Uh, velocity, uh, well, fuel cell is now one example. Chemical engineers also they have a lot of uh, reactions that have turbulence and, and all of this. But, but there still is one thing that is, that's very different. What makes combustion uh, so complicated? The time scales, that's, that's right, but I'm looking for something else. Heat release. What does the heat release do? Temperature. temperature goes up. And what does that do? Well, it increases pressure if you have a, but in a gas turbine, maybe it doesn't even increase the pressure. But now come back to the combustion. Just look at combustion. What does the higher temperature now all of a sudden, what does it do for combustion? It increases reaction rates. OK? So in a fuel cell, you have chemical reactions. They convert you know, this to that, and that's it. Okay? In combustion, you have reactions. The reactions uh, lead to heat release. The heat release increases the temperature. The temperature makes combustion faster, and, and um, you know, it makes the heat release faster. It makes the temperature increase faster, and that makes the reactions yet faster again. So we have a nonlinear feedback process, like, you know, when I go with my microphone here, I go too close to the, to the loudspeaker, then all of a sudden you get a, a big beep, 
and it develops within no time. It just, you know, all of a sudden, uh, uh, you have this loud noise. And in combustion, it's the same thing. So anytime um, you have non-linearities, things are non-linear, first of all, uh, things can go wild, okay? And secondly, you don't know what's going to happen. And, uh, and you have very complex phenomena. So combustion, because of this exponential function uh, of the, uh, in the Arrhenius expression, and the heat release, which interacts with that, um, combustion is very, you know, you, you don't know what happens. I mean, it has, um, uh, it's, it's nonlinear, there are multiple solutions always, and, and so on. So that's the, that's the, uh, the interesting part. Uh, in contrast to isothermal chemically reacting flows, if heat release, and that leads to a self-accelerating process. What's interesting then also is that each... Um, uh, so, in physics, things always get interesting when you have different processes with different timescales, okay? And if you have, uh, let's say you have two different processes, and each one has its own timescale, that means you can maybe control the time scale independently of each other. The processes interact. So you can make one fast or slow so that it's either much faster or much slower than the other process. Um, if, if, you if you ever encounter a case like this, what do you do? I tell you what to do. You, you take the two time scales, you put them in a ratio, you take the ratio of the two, and that gives you a non-dimensional group, okay? And then you name it after yourself. <laughs> that's, that's what you do. That's what, <coughs> that's what engineers, that's what they struggle their whole life with, to find two timescales where they can attach their name to. Um, I, I once found a good ratio, and I called it pi, but uh, pi was taken already, so <laughs> this didn't work out. So, uh, but the Reynolds number, for example, is, is a ratio of two different things. And if, if the viscous time scale is, is much, much shorter than, than the advective time scales, then uh, nothing happens. Creeping flow, you know, uh, small Reynolds number and all of this. But, um, you know, if the, if the opposite is the case, then, um, you, you know, things go wild, you get turbulence and, and all of this. So, um, if you have two different timescales that interact with each other, things can go crazy, uh, you know, very interesting things happen. Usually, when, when one gets faster than the other, then you have a phase transition to a different state, and so, like the laminar turbulent um, uh, transition and so on. In combustion, every single reaction has its own timescale, okay? Which means you don't have one non-dimensional group you have thousands of non-dimensional group because each single one interacts either with other reactions or it interacts with, um, uh, with, with uh, uh, transports um, here in, in uh, uh, laminar uh, fluid dynamic timescales or turbulent uh, timescales. So the, we get in addition to, for example, Reynolds number, Mach number, and, and all these, we get uh, new non-dimensional groups, which are which we call then Damkeller number, Karlovitz number, uh, uh, yeah, Damkeller number and Karlovitz number. So, but there's not just one Damkeller number. Every single reaction has its own Damkeller number. So we have potentially we have a thousand different non-dimensional groups. Now, of course, they're not all important, uh, but 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 it's more than one that's important. So that's uh, that's something to keep in mind. So in combustion, um, we, we, have, we distinguish between uh, premixed and non-premixed combustion. Uh, premixed combustion means the charge is fuel and air premixed. Usually it sparked that at some point, maybe, and, and then here like in this, uh, in this SI spark ignition engine, uh, you spark it at some point and then you get a, a spherical flame here, a turbulent uh, flame that, that propagates uh, through, the, uh, through the entire uh, combustion chamber. Or you have a flow, a premixed flow, and then the, the flame tries to burn into the, um, uh, the 
the premixed gases. And then uh, non-premixed combustion uh, is different. Uh, you have air and you inject the fuel into the air and um, somewhere between pure fuel and pure air, there's, there's a region where the mixture is exactly stoichiometric and, and that's typically then where uh, chemical reactions happen. Then you have the fuel that diffuses into the flame from one side, the oxygen from the other side, and so that's what we call this a diffusion flame because the heat release is really controlled by that diffusion process. And the question is, um, you would think that after millions of years of combustion research, uh, you would think that um, one of these technologies, one of these two different modes must prevail. One must be better than the other. But that's not the case. Uh, see, I say here, um, this is used, for example, in, in spark ignition engines or stationary gas turbines. This uh, non premix combustion is used in aircraft engines. Why is that? Um, that is because um, in, in combustion, uh, that's, a, that's an important fact, there are always different things that we need to optimize at the same time. If you want to build a combustion device, uh, you want to build a combustion device that is very efficient, okay? High efficiency in converting uh, 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 chemical energy into thermal energy. Efficient. Um, it needs to have low emissions, okay? And uh, third, what could be the third objective? What else is important? Stability, okay? Stability is very important. Why? Because... If you are in an airplane and you're flying from here to there, uh, the, the last thing you want is that the flame goes out. Oh, we have a super efficient engine. It's uh, no emissions. It's not that stable. You know, sometimes the flame blows out. Uh, that you don't want that, okay? You rather have... So if the pilot asks you, today we can either use this engine, had no emissions, but, you know... Or we use an engine, you know, has crazy emissions, smoke coming out, like there's no tomorrow, but this thing will burn. I mean, it will never go out. Um, most of you, probably more than 50%, would choose the, the safe engine, okay? So that's what we do, actually. It turns out that non premix combustion in an engine is super stable. It leads to emissions of uh, particulates, NOx, and all of this, but uh, it's super stable. Whereas premix combustion uh, has, if, so premix combustion, you can, you can have the charge a little lean. If it's lean, low temperatures, no uh, emissions of, of, um, uh, of NOx, um, no particulates, uh, everything is great. But it's not very stable. The flame blows out once in a while, maybe, uh, you can get flashback. It can burn into the, into the burner. Um, uh, you can get instabilities. Uh, you'll hear from maybe uh, those of you who take Professor Leuven's uh, course, uh, that you can have instabilities and all that. So, so that's why in different devices, uh, we use different combustion modes. And then we also always need to struggle with these things. Previous combustion, we need to struggle with stability. non premix combustion, we struggle with uh, pollutants, but but everyone has to choose, you know, how what what uh, what combustion mode to take. And I want to show you, um, you know, what the difference is between a premix and a non-premix flame. Uh, this is a here standard Bunsen burner, and let's see if we turn this on. And I want to start now with a premix flame, because what you will see is that this pre it doesn't want to burn actually. Oh, sorry. Okay, let's do that again. Okay, you see? Blows off. Blows off. See, I can't even get it really to burn. As soon as I crank up the power a little bit, it doesn't burn anymore. So let's go back to the non premix flame. We have fire sprinklers here. Let's uh, <laughs> turn it down a bit. So, so what you see is um, a Bunsen burner. 
uh, I have here a little wheel. I can um, open some holes here. If I open the holes, if I don't open the holes, if I close the holes, then nothing happens down here. The fuel uh, comes out and it mixes here with the air. And then what you see is this non-premixed flame. If we look very closely to the nozzle, you see a, a very thin bluish um, sheet. Uh, and if you look at it carefully, you see it's, it's really very thin. That is the reaction zone. Uh, chemical reactions basically do not take place outside of this. So, you know, a little bit away from this, um, it's hot, but, but there are no chemical reactions. Why? Because right at that point is where the fuel and the oxidizer meet. And on one side, you have no fuel. On the other side, you have no oxidizer, so it can't burn. So uh, what's interesting then also is that in the center of this flame, it's actually cold. And you can try this out. You stick your finger inside, and it will not burn. The tip will not burn. Okay. <laughs> so um, the blue you see is chemiluminescence, and it shows you some radicals. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this later when we talk about non premix flames. The orange here is what? Soot. I mean, it's uh, basically carbon particles that form in the very rich regions. The blue uh, actually is not just here in the bottom. The blue is all around the orange. But the orange, the, the so basically, these are carbon particles that are glowing. So the, the soot, somebody wants to get up now. Uh, so the soot. Uh, is, it is so bright that you don't see the blue anymore. But if you look very carefully, you see that the blue is just outside the, the, the uh, orange surface, okay? And it really oxidizes the soot away, which is why you don't have any black stuff coming out. If I crank this up a little bit, then you see the soot cannot be, there's so much soot that is formed, cannot oxidize, and then uh, you see the black smoke uh, coming off. The black smoke is nothing else than the orange here, which, which then cools off, it can, it, which doesn't oxidize. Now, if I open these holes here, then slowly, then you see the flame turns all blue because now it's pre-mixed. There are no rich regions anymore. Uh, there are, but, but um, not rich enough to form soot. Now you see that we form an inner flame here, which is now a partially premixed flame. This now, so this is, I go richer. This is so rich that it can't burn inside. So this is still just a diffusion flame. If I turn this down, I go above the, or below the flammability limits of the, um, of the rich mixture. And now we get a very rich premixed flame in the center. What comes off of this is still, you know, CuO and uh, hydrogen, and that burns then in an outer reaction zone. You see that the color is a little different because they're different radicals. The, the C, uh, activated C uh, carbon, that has a little more greenish color, and you get a lot more of that in the center. The lighter uh, blue, the outer blue color is more from uh, OH, maybe. So then... If I open this even more, then you see I get a, uh, just a premixed flame, and now I can crank it up without blowing off, and you get a really turbulent flame. And why is that? Why does it not blow off now? Because, um, because uh, why does it not blow off? Because now it's a little hot. The, the burner is hot, and so it stabilizes. But you see, the burner being a little hot or not hot, that makes all the difference. I mean, the, at, you know, at first it, it blows out, and then it does not. And then now when I turn it down, then you get uh, heat losses to the burner, and then it, it goes out because just the heat losses to the burner. Uh, one thing that I always find uh, interesting when you look at premix or non-premix flames is the, the thermal power of this non-premix flame and the premix flame I'm showing you is exactly the same because I, I don't change the fuel. I just add the air in a different place. But this flame is all, you know, very stable, very lazy. And this thing here, 
Uh, this is the same thermal power. It's turbulent. It's very, very compact, very small compared to the non-premixed flame. Uh, but the, the, the power is the same. So you can already see. But this, again, is close to being blown off. And even if I crank this up, now if I just add the air again, I get a very uh, lazy uh, kind of a flame. Let's turn this off before we get, the, uh, before we get rain here. So um, premix and non-premix, they're, they're very, very different. I mean, in their appearance, in the... Uh, you saw in the uh, pollutants they form uh, and, and, and these things. And one thing you see already here, although in the engine it's, it's slightly different reasons, one thing you see already here is that um, the non-premix flame for the same thermal power, it needs, it, 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 it's much more stable, first of all. This thing here, I mean, I can even shake it around. It doesn't, it doesn't really go out. Uh, it's much more stable, but also it needs a lot more space. What you want when you make a combustion device, you want to have, um, uh, you want to have uh, high power density. Okay, you want a small flame like the premix flame. So, so very often what you want is the premix flame, uh, but maybe stability issues force you uh, to use the non-premix flame. Okay, so uh, there are different uh, ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I, I mentioned this already. But, uh, but, but all of this uh, are possibilities. But increase in efficiency, that's something I didn't say before. Uh, making processes better, by, maybe by also uh, having a, a, a totally different process, uh, that's, that's something that uh, is important, and combustion theory uh, greatly assists in, in doing that. So the aim of this course, then, is to provide an understanding of the processes that are involved um, from physical and chemical perspective. Um, we will not talk about kinetics because there is a separate course on kinetics here. We'll also not talk about uh, homogeneous systems, explosions, um, uh, the explosion diagram, for example, homogeneous reactor, because that's usually what the, what the um, chemists um, use. And so uh, Professor Pilling uh, will, will uh, talk about this uh, in, in his course. Um, but we talk about uh, thermodynamics. Uh, we'll, today we'll talk about the first and second law of thermodynamics. The first law basically tells us what the flame temperature is. The second law allows us to uh, determine equilibrium uh, conditions. And then in terms of applications, so we talk about uh, fluid mechanics, uh, turbulence then also later in the course. And in terms of applications, uh, you know, we, we will talk about uh, different applications here, maybe in, uh, uh, internal combustion engines, gas turbines, uh, furnaces, and so on. There is a, uh, a text here, which um, is from Norbert Peters, who taught this course in, uh, uh, several years ago. Um, the, the, the way this, this, the material here is, uh, changed a little bit uh, in its content, but, but this still uh, is a good foundation for this course. If you want to look something up or read up on, on something, this actually is available uh, on our website in, in Aachen. You can download uh, this, uh, this book. Um, and we'll have two parts here. We'll talk about first uh, laminar flames or fundamentals and laminar flames. And then we uh, talk about turbulence first and then turbulent combustion. So these are the topics. Introduction is what we did now. Then uh, after the break, we'll continue with mass balances, uh, thermodynamics, flame temperature. And then we'll talk about uh, laminar uh, uh, premix flames and diffusion flames. And then um, we'll uh, introduce this um, tool. Um, flame Master is a, a computer code that you can use to do simulations of uh, maybe uh, of all possible one-dimensional flame configurations and also uh, zero-dimensional homogeneous uh, configurations uh, to compute ignition delay times, to compute burning velocities, uh, compute flame structure, and so on. And this, um, actually, you can also uh, download for free on our website. It's uh, relatively easy to install also. And maybe you want to uh, download this and install it if you 
guys bring a laptop and then we can have a hands-on uh, training session uh, during one of these uh, lectures. Um, I, I've tried this every single year uh, in the past years and it never worked. No one, no one ever managed to install. But we have spent a lot of time in, um, now in making the installation of the code much easier. So it's all uh, CMake. Uh, um, and so if you have a Unix shell, uh, you, you can just do CMake and it, it installs itself. Uh, there's also instructions for Windows, um, which I, I don't use. Um, so it's a little more complicated, I think, on, on Windows. If you have a Mac, then, then it's also easy to install it. Uh, then part two is uh, turbulent combustion. Um, here we'll have uh, first talk about turbulence, turbulence theory. For, for those who, who don't know turbulence, then we talk about turbulent premix combustion, turbulent non premix combustion uh, briefly, and then about modeling. Uh, there is one section at the end on applications, and usually I, I don't make it to the applications. I'll talk about applications in between also, um, but, but that final uh, section uh, I, I don't think we'll have the time uh, to go through this. Okay, I think uh, it's about one hour now, is it? Yeah, so maybe we'll have a break now and we'll have, um, we continue at uh, 10 o'clock.